All right. Well, hello to all the folks out there in live stream land. It is a pleasure to have you all with us this evening or morning or whatever the time might be where you are. My name is Will Schultz, and I'm an assistant professor of religions in the Americas at the University of Chicago Divinity School. And we are here in Swift Hall, home of the University of Chicago Divinity School, at an event graciously sponsored by the Martin Marty Center for the Public Understanding of Religion. Uh, and we are here, and it is such a pleasure to be here, with uh, Professor Rebecca Davis, who is the Miller Family Endowed Early Career Professor in the History Department at the University of Delaware. And she researches and teaches on the history of the modern United States with a particular focus on gender, sexuality, and religion all of which are gonna come up in our conversation this evening. So her first book, More Perfect Unions, The American Search for Marital Bliss, provided a history of marital counseling in the United States. Recently, she served as the editor for the collected volume, Heterosexual Histories, and is the producer for the truly wonderful podcast, Sexing History, about the history of gender and sexuality, which I would encourage all of you to listen to. Most recently, she was the recipient uh, of a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities to work on her next project, our focus this evening will be on her most recent book, Public Confessions, The Religious Conversions That Changed American Politics. Rebecca, thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So first, for the viewers who have not yet had the privilege of reading the book, can you just give us a sense of what Public Confessions is about? I'd, I'd be glad to. So Public Confessions is a history of uh, post-World War II United States conversations about political and religious sincerity. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that by the, by the end of the book, we see that there are certain kinds of presentations of faith that are understood within American politics to support democracy and to support freedom, and others that are, that are not. And so I was thinking about why was it that so often religious converts are held up as the exemplars of religious authenticity, and how does that play out in our politics? So I trace that back to Claire Booth Luce, who was a member of Congress and converted to Catholicism in 1946. And then I look at other controversial religious conversions as they played out in the public sphere to think about where the personal or private decision to adopt a new faith intersects with ideas about free will, democracy, um, and what it means, what those things mean in American politics. Yeah, and so you mentioned some of the key figures in this book, people like Claire Booth Luce, and this is very much built around individual stories. Mm -hmm. So can you give us a sense of, you know, who the cast of characters is and sure. how you settled on? Because there's so many fascinating people who could be in a book like this. Right. Uh, so Claire Booth Luce and uh, Monsignor Fulton Sheen, who was her sort of tutor and guide through her conversion, are the central characters of the first chapter. I then look at some of the more famous or infamous former communists who mm -hmm. became Christian, um, some Catholic, some other forms of Christianity, uh, as in these post-war years in the midst of the Cold War Red Scare, and all of whom aligned with the political right. And this, the, a lot of scholars have looked at those figures and thought about those conversions as instrumentalist. Mm -hmm. And I, 
I think that that's an interesting place to enter the conversation. But I was also more interested in how um, the sort of sexual narratives that went along with those conversions. So how does this authentic uh, defender of American democracy also end up presenting themselves as uh, unquestionably heterosexual and how all of those parts get wrapped together. I look at the concern over um, mind control and brainwashing. There was this very unusual uh, guy named Harvey Matuso who worked for Roy Cohn, who was, uh, had briefly been a communist but then really leveraged that time to be an informant and then said, actually, I, I made most of it up. And the informant system pretty much collapsed in his wake but he was on this religious journey as well. Um, and why, the reason why I talk about him is that one of the themes of the book is not only which conversions help certain people and certain faiths and certain politics seem more authentic, but also concurrently why there is so much fear um, about fakery and mind control. So two different things. One is the person who knowingly pretends to be a different faith and the other the person who really thinks they are being sincere but has lost control over their own mind. And both fears were very much part of the public culture of this period. Uh, I have a chapter that looks at Sammy Davis Jr., Marilyn Monroe, and Elizabeth Taylor, celebrity con converts to Judaism in between the 1950s and 1960. I look at uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, announcement that he was a member of the Nation of Islam in 1964. He is one of the figures who is explicitly uh, denigrated as someone who's been brainwashed, that he hasn't freely chosen this faith. And he is adamant. You know, he's one of these people who you see over and over again articulating this democratic ideal of freedom of conscience. I'm free to be who I want to be. I get to choose who I am. And the way that the political discourse of the era tries to strip that away from him. Um, and then uh, in a final chapter, I look at some of the prominent born again conversions of the 1970s with a focus on Chuck Colson, a convicted former aide to President Nixon, as well as Susan Atkins and Eldridge Cleaver and others. Right, and so you mentioned that sexuality and marriage in particular is often a big part of these stories about how being in a heterosexual marriage reinforces often that religious authenticity. And your first book was about marriage and ideas of marriage. So did it flow naturally from one book to the other the way it is for some lucky people? Or was it a more <laughs> circuitous road from the first book? It was. It was wildly circuitous. I <laughs> thought, I had a sort of intellectual experiment. Wouldn't it be neat to know what sex radicals of the mm -hmm. teens and 20s thought about religion? Mm -hmm. And I started going to archives to research that. And if anybody figures that out, please let me know, because I have no idea what they thought about religion. I couldn't figure out that project. And I um, was at the Library of Congress doing some keyword searches to try to find, putting in the keywords, Bolshevism, religion, sex, um, and uh, Claire Booth Luce came up. And so I was fascinated to learn about her conversion and equally interested in the fact that I didn't really know anything about it. I've read a lot of books about post-World War II American politics and religion. Here is a member of Congress married to the most powerful publisher in the United States at the time, Henry Luce, with time and life and fortune. Um, why didn't we know more about her conversion? And the project developed from there. The question of who to include and who mm -hmm. not to include is, uh, you know, the question a lot of us get asked about our right. books, right? And so in this one, I wanted to look at conversions that were not simply significant to the individual, as I think these conversions almost always are, but were significant to the public and that precipitated a public conversation around democracy, around free will, around who gets to claim their authentic self in the public sphere and have that honored by the people around them and who is uh, discredited. So uh, as sort of a footnote to that, I mm -hmm. think that so many people would say to me, oh, but aren't you going to also write about so-and-so? Right. And I think that that shows how much 
more work we need on religious conversion as this incredibly common, yet I don't think sufficiently studied process in American uh, religious history. And I think studying conversion, because as you said, it, we think of it as something very private mm -hmm. and very personal, and indeed beyond any kind of scholarly explanation. So it seems like a difficult thing to study. So I'd be interested to hear more about how you decided to approach it, if there were sources or methods or even models that you found useful in tackling these seemingly really personal issues and bringing out their sort of public consequence. Sure. So sociologists and mm -hmm. anthropologists have done far more to study the process, the phenomenon of religious conversion than historians have. So I learned a lot from reading in the sociology of religion mm -hmm. and you know, there's, there's significant work helping me understand something I had noticed but hadn't yet named, mm -hmm. which is that there is conversion that is um, sort of a journey from one place to another, a real ch a change. There's a journey, there's a conversion that's a coming home, mm -hmm. a sense of having been, been found and now located in a, in a place of truth. Um, and, you know, there, uh, in graduate school, I was, you know, often sort of confused about the conversations we had in seminar and the mm -hmm. books that I read about conversion because they almost always talked about it as the Protestant conversion model of a uh, sort of interior process that has this component of, you know, divine, a, a relationship to the divine, a sort of revelation, an experience of grace, an experience of um, understanding of, of Jesus, of the divine in a new way, and then of being transformed from that point forward. But that's really a particular kind of conversion. And I think that we miss a lot when we take that as the model for how we understand conversion um, writ large. For so many other faiths, it's a process of um, ritual, it's a process of, um, you know, uh, study or, you know, memorization mm -hmm. or, or so on. Um, I also think, though, that I started to look at the history around Sammy Davis Jr.'s conversion, and he says, you know, I've always been a Jew, right? and, and I've always been a Jew in my thinking, and I think that for so many people, you know, we need to, we need to really stop and listen to those voices mm -hmm. of converts. So I learned a lot from reading sociology, and then I try to take what I'd learned and apply it to my primary sources that I got from the archive and think about, well, what is this person telling me about how their conversion felt uh, to them? And um, I, for the most part, try to stay away from evaluating whether right. they were sincere or not. I didn't see that as my task in this book, um, but um, I think that we need, I think we need to think about conversion as sort of, what does it mean to think of conversion as the story of American religion, mm -hmm. rather than a story of these distinct religious entities interacting or distinct sets of faiths interacting with one another, but rather think about American religious history as all of these people in, in kind of in motion, moving mm -hmm. among faiths, moving between them, leaving faith altogether, returning to faith or finding faith for the first time, um, what would it mean to take that as the starting point for trying to understand how religion works? I'm almost wondering, do you think conversion is a really useful term? Because I was curious about the title right. as public confessions right. rather than public uh, conversions, right. which you know brings up ideas about narration and hearing people's voices. Right. So I'm wondering, like in particular, how you and probably the editor as well came to that title and whether that says something larger about, you know, whether conversion really is the right term to, to approach these questions. I, can, I don't recall, we, I, we went through many different titles. <laughs> I don't recall how we landed on this one, but I do know that the reason we settled on it is that all of these stories involve a, a conversation between the person mm -hmm. and the wider public, and this sort of process of them explaining themselves often over and over again, 
to, to con try to convince other people that this thing that they're saying is true and that it's important. Um, and, and for some of these folks, particularly mm -hmm. some of the people earlier, well, actually throughout the book, there's also a certain degree of acknowledging past error. Mm -hmm. Sort of this, that in, in t talking to the public about their new faith, they are also trying to remedy something broader than themselves that they have been part of, whether it's um, you know, anti-communism or whether it's um, corruption, there's, there's often that confession of here's, here's, the, here's the error in our world, here's the deep, you know, massive human problem we need to confront, and here is how, and I was complicit in that, and here I am now in this new faith trying to do better. Um, so, uh, that's, I, I think that that's why that right. terminology resonated for us. And your mention of anti-communism leads to my next question, because the book is fairly neatly bounded by the Cold War. And you start with Claire Booth Luce at the, the very beginning of the Cold War, and we end in the Nixon era with Charles Colson and the sort of last decades of that conflict. So how important is the Cold War and these geopolitical issues to the conversion histories you tell in this book? I think they're extremely important. And I, I think that having lived through, personally now lived through several geopolitical or national crises, I feel, you know, I, I think when I'd studied the Cold War in college, I thought, wow, people were really freaking out, weren't they? Like, it seemed like there was just mass <laughs> hysteria. And then you, know, you live through something like 9-11 or the January 6th insurrection mm -hmm. or even you know, before that, and you realize, oh no, people, there, there's, there's something different to living with sort of existential dread. And I think that in, in the people that I write about, um, and whether it was a sort of global Cold War they're worried about, mm -hmm or domestic civil rights and the sort of crisis of um, inequality, racial inequality in the United States, racial oppression, they really saw a great deal at stake, not just for themselves personally, but for the world. Uh, so the Cold War is, is, the Cold War and the civil rights movement are sort of the two broad um, political topics I engage with. And sometimes it's quite direct. I mean, I think that this, these, for Claire Booth Luce, it was her fears about fascism in the late 30s and the 40s that then made her uh, an early, uh, one, of the, one of the earlier folks to sort of warn about uh, Stalin and the, the threat she saw coming uh, from the Soviet Union. And for her, um, conversion had to happen so that each individual would have the sort of spiritual fortification, this internal ability to resist the thrall of materialism and of communism. Um, so she was even, so, uh, so um, w and then for other folks like Sammy Davis Jr., it was about um, Judaism was for him a reaffirmation of his rights as an African American, as a model of civil rights and resistance. And with the idea of religion as a kind of self-discipline or self-fortification, that gets into the discipline of psychology as well. And one of the really fascinating themes running throughout this book is what I saw as the increasing authority and the increasing presence of psychology in mm -hmm. every aspect of American life. Yeah. So can you, tell, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how psychology runs through this whole story and what role psychologists played and how people uh, kind of popular notions of psychology? Sure, so I think a lot of post-World War II psychology is concerned with the self, the, mm -hmm. the, with, and Eric Erickson, you know, very famously writing about the identity crisis, this whole notion that uh, we have a self that is its own discrete thing that we must discover and understand, and that it's the thing that makes us who we are in the world. Um, more and more people have an awareness of this. And 
I've, throughout the, the scholarship that I've done, I've been very interested in the ways in which people from a religious approach and people from a psychological approach and talk about some of the same questions, mm -hmm. whether it's marriage or gender or sexuality or um, individuality, the self. How do you know who you really are? And how do you trust that someone else is who they say they are? So in the context of the Cold War, in the context of this fear of these oppressive, the way that politics or evil political leaders might cause masses of people to believe something that isn't true, but really convince them that it is. Um, those fears, I think, were ones that psychologists were very interested in helping people understand, but also that the folks that I study found answers to through religion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Their sense of self and their mm -hmm. sense of identity. And explaining, I mean, a conversion narrative is often a narrative of the, the journey of the self, right? And so for many of these folks, it was, it became the language, religion, and religious conversion specifically, became their story of themselves. And your sort of suggestion at the end is that religion maybe no longer has quite that power when talking about people's personal journeys, if I'm reading it right, that this era of the fascination with the public religion conversions has maybe passed by Am I reading that right? And if so, is there something that caused that change to different questions about identity and authenticity? I think today the conversations around identity that are most provocative mm -hmm. in our public conversations are more often around gender and sexuality and, and or around race. So um, the questions of can you really say do you trust who a person says they are? Right. And who can claim which parts of identity? We're very comfortable with um, politicians switching religion, often quite often. There are some political mm -hmm. figures who've moved around a bunch, and um, we don't really seem to bat an eye at it anymore, um, in part because of the way in which the sort of larger realignment that many, many people have written about mm -hmm. in American religion between now more sort of conservative versus progressive versions. And as long as you're converting within fates that are now more associated with one of those two uh, parts of the divide, the, the, spe the specifics of the faith are less significant in our politics. Whereas Catholic versus Protestant in 1946 was a huge deal. Right. Uh, and that we don't really see that to the same degree. You have these wonderful examples of people writing the Claire Booth Luce and telling her that she must be wrong. She must have been fooled by yeah. some priest. Yes, yes. So the issue of Claire Booth Luce, because she was, again, even if she's not remembered as much at the time, she was a tremendous, uh, even if she's not as well remembered now, mm -hmm. she was a huge celebrity mm -hmm. at the time. And it, so is this also a story of like, the emergence of a modern celebrity culture and the role of media and entertainment. So how does that flow into the story of religion and politics? Because so many of these people are, again, even if we don't remember Harvey Mattisau, they were really well known at the time. Right. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if Claire Booth Luce really reaches the level of celebrity in the way, I, I, I learned very quickly, I had uh -huh. some scholars of celebrity sort of say, no, 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 you can't talk about folks this way. We have rules, we have rules about who meets what criteria for celebrity, so I'll leave that to them uh, to figure out. But certainly she was very famous mm -hmm. and very good at public relations. So um, one of the other parts of the stories that I chose to include is that they're stories that become part of a media narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's how, you know, for, for historians, we're always trying to figure out reception, like, well, what did other people think of this? And so at least if we can show how pervasively distributed this message was, we can get a sense of um, how many people would have accessed it, would have heard it or seen it or read it. And so certainly, uh, Claire Booth Luce publishes this series of articles. Uh, it's a three-part article in McCall's magazine in 1947 explaining the version she wants to explain to the public about her choice of Catholicism, and it's called The Real Reason. And McCall's is a family magazine. It's both subscription and newsstand. Millions of people read it. Mm -hmm. It's and, and I find this interesting 
as sort of an intellectual history of non-intellectuals, right? This uh -huh. is, she's a, she's a deep thinker, and she's been studying with a very serious theologian, but she's then writing about Catholicism to appeal to, you know, the suburban housewife. And um, so, so that's one of the areas where I tried to um, focus. Um, yeah. Well, and as you said, her, the person often credited with converting her, Fulton Sheen, was himself right. a deep thinker mm -hmm. who nonetheless knew how and tried really hard to communicate those complex ideas in a simple way mm -hmm. to a really broad right. audience. And he was more of a celebrity uh, than Luce was, really. I mean, he had a regular you know, weekly radio show already, and by 1952 or so, he had a weekly television show, which was watched by like 30 million people on average. So uh, he is, fits much more that sort of celebrity uh, definition, I suppose. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if it's a story about celebrity so much as it is a story about how, mm -hmm. how these famous and well-known people used or were used by interest in religion to generate broader conversations about identity and freedom and democracy. And it is really interesting to see how the religious communities that these people are converting to, the possibilities and the dangers that they see with these conversions. More possibilities, like mm -hmm. there are lots of stories here about people being really excited, like, oh, now we can claim Claire Booth Luce for our own. Right. And there's always this sort of assumption that a convert in one way or another is going to evangelize mm -hmm. for our faith. So is that always the case? Is conversion, does that always seem to be connected with hmm. that sort of evangelization when people are converted? Do they always go out and try to spread that message? Or did you see examples here of people who, who didn't approach it? that way. Hmm. I don't, that's a great question. I don't think that some of the, um, I don't think that, well, I think actually all of these people did in their own way, whether it was through writing a book length mm -hmm. conversion narrative where they explained why what they went through was so wonderful. Uh, Claire Boothus was very explicit about mm -hmm. going out and seeking converts to Catholicism. Uh, I mean, someone, so, when Elizabeth Taylor converts to Judaism, the rabbi who officiates over her conversion says, and I was able at the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati to hear all of this on a cassette tape, which was great. <laughs> he you know, sort of says to her, um, think about what you can do, right? Because someone as glamorous and sort of as beautiful as she is, is going to be able to do a lot for us in the Jewish community. Now, I don't know that Elizabeth Taylor really saw herself that way. She was. Uh, very generous to Jewish organizations and remained so throughout her life. Um, she doesn't really, though, put herself forward as a Jewish public figure. Uh, but for, I mean, Patrick Allett has a great book about mm -hmm. Catholic intellectuals often looking in, in sort of the Anglo and American examples, the, the British and American examples, um, how the convert often becomes a sort of public intellectual. And I think that's a very compelling idea. And I was really interested in seeing how that plays out at the non sort of formal intellectual level and more at the everyday popular culture level. So it's a combination both of the people who do the converting, wanting converts to do mm -hmm. that for them. And then there are some converts who kind of take it up on their own, uh, particularly for women who are um, sort of normatively attractive, right? So for Claire Booth mm -hmm. Luce, you know, the sort of white, uh, blonde, you know, slender, sort of normative, uh, sort of attractive figure, Elizabeth Taylor, who was stunning, you know, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, there was a lot of great excitement about how the, the sort of um, sexualization right. of their appeal as converts was seen as very important to showing people that both Catholicism in one instance and Judaism in the others was an appealing faith. And sexuality really seems to run through this whole story so closely bound up with all of these conversions. What is it, do you think, that made religion and sexuality so tightly bound together in this period? Why, again and again, in so many different contexts, whether 
uh, it's Whitaker Chambers and his uh, sexuality, or questions about Muhammad Ali and his sexuality. Why does it seem to be, do you think, such a, such a constant here? So I think it's always there. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of my interest as a scholar is trying to show that we always miss something if we're not paying attention to how sexuality and gender shape the past. And our field of American religious history has seen extraordinary mm -hmm. work um, looking at showing how race is always part of American right. religion and looking at the sort of way that capitalism and class shape all aspects of American religious life. And I really want to add to that conversation that whether we're writing about American politics or American religion, we always need to also be writing about gender and sexuality, that there's no way to disentangle those things. And what I tried to show in this book mm -hmm. is that by the 1970s, self-identifying as a particular kind of faith becomes a way to sort of collapse all of those identities into one. Mm -hmm. So you signal a certain kind of heterosexual virtue. You signal a kind of positioning relative to the civil rights movement, um, all by saying, I am this. And um, just because the statement, you know, Chuck Colson never says, I'm a heterosexual. But I don't <laughs> think that we can understand his importance or his journey or the reception of his conversion without thinking about it. Right, right. Um, that's, uh, and again, it's interesting to see how people who don't fit into those neat categories, people like Sammy Davis Jr. in particular, mm -hmm. Uh, become often an object of ridicule yes. and mockery because it just seems so incomprehensible. And there, mm -hmm. you, you say how Davis has to constantly explain over and over again mm -hmm. what the thinking behind his conversion was. Yes, yes. He's, I mean, uh, he's a person that I developed a lot of um, sort of empathy for mm -hmm. as I was reading his, uh, more, learning more about him and learning more of his story. Um, He's a very complicated figure, as, as all of these people are. But yes, he insisted throughout his entire life that he was Jewish, that it was a choice he made because it's the faith that, uh, that he belonged to. And this is always uh, like with a biography, which this is in some ways sort of a mini series of biographies. Lots of biographers talk about the strange feeling of getting to know these people who maybe you have never met. And I'd be curious to hear you talk more about just the sort of that experience of the mm -hmm. book, what that felt like, getting to know these people in what is, again, supposed to be a very intimate uh, question, and whether that was challenging at points. Um. <laughs> I suppose there were a few people I didn't really want to know <laughs> as well, um, though, I, though it was my, my task to, uh -huh. to, to get to know Always them a challenge, a, as yeah. a better. Um, it, was, it was honestly, as a historian, it was incredibly rewarding to spend mm -hmm. time getting to know people in that way. Um, it wasn't something I'd done with my first book, which was more about a sort of uh, broader professional and avocational movement. Um, and I really, I mean, I really appreciated how, grand, how grandiose Claire Booth Luce was, that she saved every piece of uh, paper anyone ever sent her, that she was certain she would be famous and so needed to have an archive for the, for the rest of us to read. Um, Sammy Davis Jr. does not have an archive. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali does not. Uh, so it was much more difficult to n get to know them as well. I did the best I could through interviews and, um, and other materials, but um, it's sort of a privilege to get to know people in this way. And um, yeah, a, a, few, a few of them I was glad to be, I was glad when the chapter was written so I could you know, uh, think a little bit less about them on a daily basis. Oh, God bless those people who keep all their papers. <laughs> I wrote a little about Fulton Sheen and I believe he burned quite a few of his records and manuscripts. Yes, so. it's very difficult to track down his records. <laughs> <laughs> well, so one of the questions that anyone who 
studies, American history or US history gets is a sort of the comparison, right? How much is this specifically an American story? Is there something distinctively American about this? And I'm sure at some points you've already encountered versions of this question. So I'm wondering how much is this an American story? Mm -hmm. And whether in your conversations with other people, whether they have brought up similar cases uh, from nations outside the United States, interesting points of comparison that you thought, oh, that, that sounds very similar in an interesting way or different in an interesting way. To the second part of your question, no. Um, mm -hmm. Almost all the examples people have said, oh, why don't you also write about this person or what about that person, have been uh, US examples. Interesting. I think that we've, you know, there's a lot of work to, that supports the idea that the United States' relationship to religion in the 20th century is somewhat anomalous uh, mm -hmm. and is exceptional in, in a variety of ways, um, both the sort of the diversity of it um, and the enthusiasm for it and the degree to which it uh, infiltrates American politics. So I, th I think the sort of difference is already there. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of then thinking about well, what, where does conversion come in? Um, Lincoln Mullen has a great book um, on conversion in the United States as, it's, as, a, as a process and how this idea that conversion is a choice mm -hmm. was so firmly established in the United States by the turn of the 20th century. And it's very compelling work and I think it ties into that idea of that I then wanted to probe a bit more in, in my book about well, what about when someone's choice is denigrated or is questioned. Um, and so the degree to which the United States has this sort of reverence for freedom of conscience and religious diversity, while at the same time um, being very inequitable in how it validates people's religious movements and gives credence to people's religious expression, that was kind of what I wanted to interrogate. And the, yeah, the enduring importance at least rhetorical, of freedom of conscience seems critical here. Did you ever think of, say, extending the timeline back to something in the 19th century? Um, there are lots of interesting conversion stories there, but it might be different from what you were trying to go for here. Right. I, I um, really saw the confluence of this, the, the geopolitical crisis of the 1940s and the power of these conversion narratives to shaping um, the way people talked about that crisis as different. Um, and, I'm, and I think it would be wonderful for someone to, else to write a book where they show that I'm wrong and show that this happened much sooner. Um, I will be, be glad to, to talk with someone about that work. Um, my, my perspective um, led me to start the project here. Again, there are so many fascinating books which could be spun off from yeah. even just a sentence in here. <laughs> so uh, were there figures, you know, who were some of the figures who, I, I had the pleasure of doing some research work for this book, so I know a little bit about this, but I, I think people would be really interested to hear more about figures who you considered, who you thought about writing about, but they just didn't seem to fit or you didn't have the space or time to bring them into the story. Uh, I spent, as you know, a great deal of time studying other converts to Catholicism during the 40s and 50s and wrote quite extensively about them. And it was in the process of trying to shape a book that would have a through line and be readable. Um, and not try to cover everything about conversion. My book is not really about conversion writ large. Mm -hmm. It's about this particular kinds of conversions that engage in these particular conversations. And so, for example, Thomas Merton is mm -hmm. so, such a luminous writer and so culturally significant. He's, I, I couldn't see where he would fit in this conversation I was having in the book. So, and, and Dorothy Day as well, another convert to Catholicism. Um, many other converts to Catholicism who wrote mem you know, autobiographies uh, about their experiences. Um, I had 
three chapters on Eldridge Cleaver, <laughs> 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 which became, I think, five pages or something. Um, I also had three chapters on Claire Booth Luce, which became one chapter. So uh, I'm trying to think if there were others who didn't really make the cut. Um, th that's who comes to mind right now. Uh, so there were, there were a lot of painful decisions. I was really interested in writing a book that would appeal beyond, that would be really useful to historians and others who study this, um, to students of these topics, but also to, to readers who might mm -hmm. see that it has Muhammad Ali and Sammy Davis Jr., Claire Booth Luce in it, and then learn something from it in a way that was um, not off-putting. And it's worth reiterating just what a beautifully written book this is, like how clearly written, clear in its arguments, easy to follow, like it, you've clearly succeeded in that, well, in that aim. And in terms then of getting the message across, I'm also wondering, because you're a teacher as well as a writer and researcher, has the work that you did for this book, has it filtered in any way into what you teach or how you teach? Not a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, so I've t I teach a senior seminar in modern American religion. And I do believe I taught it twice while I was working on this book. Um, so it certainly, I was learning more about all of these figures and their importance. And I could bring that to my students in our conversations and in the books we read. Uh, I primarily, for the last two or three years, have been teaching uh, undergraduate and graduate courses more on the histories of gender and sexuality. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so I don't think that this work has come into play quite as much, except that you know there's a surprise to me in researching the final chapter of this book mm -hmm. was how often um, somewhat gratuitous violence against women uh, appears in some of these born again conversion narratives. Hmm. And um, so I've been, in, in the way I teach the history of sexuality and the way that I write about it, I am trying to be more attuned to the surprising places uh, where sexual violence emerges as sometimes just a plot device. Right. Um, uh, and, and to try to help my students be more attuned to noticing that when it happens as well. And that question of violence in these conversion narratives relates to the recent work of Kristen Dume and Jesus and John Wayne, who. Uh, we had here for our last conversation at the Marty Center, as a matter of fact. And before we started filming here, you mentioned that the project that you're currently working on is related to this, to the question of the history of sexuality. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about how you're approaching this really big and really complex question and maybe what lessons you're taking into it from the work that went into this? So. There's always this, um, well, when, when you sit and you do a close reading of a text mm -hmm. and you draw your conclusion, you figure, okay, I think I understand what this means. And then I often step, take a step back and say, wait, but I'm already bringing a set of ideas and life experiences to this text. Maybe I'm reading into it too far, right? Maybe the fact that I'm always reading books and thinking about the history of sexuality, I've brought something here that isn't here. And then um, it was 2020. Mm -hmm. And Kristen's book came out, and then as I was finishing this book, um, you know, the insurrection <laughs> happened, and I was like, no, actually, I think I underplayed it. You know, I think I didn't, I don't think I went too far at all, and I think that I need to trust in what I see when I read these sources about the sort of normalization of sexual violence against women as often part of these narratives of redemption uh, for, for white men. And that that's unfortunately a theme that emerges in some of this work. So yeah, now I'm working on this single volume history of sex in the United States and the lands that preceded it. And I am trying to trust what I see. Uh, at the same time, especially when working on the earlier chapters, mm -hmm. to recognize that 400, 500 years ago, ideas about gender and sexuality were, were so different um, in, in so many ways. Um, so the challenge of that book is to write with a thematic arc that doesn't 
transpose contemporary ideas about identity and desire onto people for whom that would have been, um, would have been nonsensical. And do you see religion as being a really key factor in this story that you're trying to tell? This is something I'm really interested in figuring out. So historians of American religion are really good at writing about lived religion and understanding religion as part of who a person is and how their everyday lives. Historians of sexuality have not tended to write about religion that way. They've written about religion as something external, often something problematic. They often, occasionally you see religious spaces, so you see histories of sexuality that talk about churches or synagogues. Um, you see certain religious figures who are important individuals show up. But religion as just part of the fabric of life, of people's experiences, is less often present. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to, having had a sort of a foot in both of those fields, make sure that when religion does show up in my history of sex, that I am writing about it the way a scholar of religion would write about it. Um, and that's, I, that's something I'm still working on as, I, as the book develops. So kind of a closing question about the sort of the process of writing, because there might be people watching this who might be graduate students or other people embarking on a writing and research project like this, uh, which again, a tremendous amount of work went into this. It's the result is beautiful, but it took, a, it took a lot of work. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you have any general thoughts or advice or suggestions for people who are just starting to tackle a challenge like you were able to tackle and surmount in this book. I, I, I think, um, I mean, I, I did work on it for a very long time and pretty consistently. The, the things that helped me were when I asked other people for help. And I think that so often, you know, a lot of our research is necessarily uh, solitary. Mm -hmm. You know, we, the work we do in the archives, um, the interpretation we do of our sources is necessarily an individual task. But there were so many times when I was completely stuck in writing, like sort of asking myself, what does Claire Bouffelius have to do with these other people? How could this possibly be one book? And I had other readers, um, colleagues, and, and other people who helped me do that. And so I think that behind much great academic scholarship that has a single author's name on mm. the spine, there is a large community of people who have helped that happen. So uh, yeah, I would say make sure you have uh, readers, and readers at different stages, the, the, the friends you can air your dirty laundry to, and then the <laughs> folks you only want to show the almost done pro product to tw toward the end, but have all of those different kinds of readers um, to help you out. Yes, it's uh, not always easy for people and for academics in particular to ask for help and outside advice, but it is an essential part of it. Yeah. Rebecca, thank you so much for this conversation. It was such a pleasure talking with you about this book, uh, which, again, I would encourage, if you don't already have a copy, Public Confessions by Rebecca Davis, a wonderful book on a fascinating topic. Thank you for joining us here in Swift Hall. Thank you so much.